Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to our Zamru Shabbat service. We are delighted to see all of you who are in our garden as well, knowing that some of you are watching by live stream. And hopefully many of you who are on live stream will come on during our Torah service to be part of our Zoom link. And our Director of Communications, Seth Front, will share with you a little bit later the Zoom link so you can join us during our Torah service and our 
for a study later on this morning as we uh, come to the conclusion of our service. We are celebrating many, many wonderful things this morning. Um, most we're celebrating the fact that we are here together in person, many of us. And for those of you on Zoom or on live stream, God willing, uh, soon you will feel comfortable coming back in to our synagogue community. We have a very special event on June 27th. Hopefully you have signed up for that. Our re-entry event where lots of wonderful things are going to take place. If you have been to a, a Zamru service, you know that the idea behind a Zamru service is to change the way in which we think about prayer and that we sit in a service and daven. Oftentimes, we're overwhelmed by the just uh, enormous amount of tefillot that we have to go through in any service. The sidor, um, once upon a time, was not this thick, but it is today. And we feel this obligation and this need to be able to make sure that we recite every single letter and word and prayer in the sidor. But in fact, that's not always the way it has been. And there's a balance between keva, which is the fixed structure of the sidor, and kavana, which is the intention or the direction or the aim of our heart and our mind as we pray. And so the Zamru service is supposed to slow us down a little bit and give us a chance to take note of what it is that we are saying, what it is that we are reading, what it is that we are praying, and how we can add a little bit more kavana to our keva. And each time we have a Zamru service, Cantor Rafi and I try to think about what theme fits into perhaps the Torah portion that we're reading on a given Shabbat or something that's happening in our lives, something in the environment around us, and how we could connect the Sidor and the prayers of our people to that theme of the Torah portion. And so today, the Torah portion that we're going to be reading is Korach. And as we know, Korach is all about rebellion. It's about conflict. And it's about two types of conflict according to our sages. Um, the conflict of Korach, which is lo l'shem shemaim, or and the arguments and the conflicts of Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, which are l'shem shemaim, for the sake of heaven versus not for the sake of heaven. So what we want to do today is invite you to think about conflict in your own life. Um, less about the conflict than how we can manage that conflict in a healthy physiological emotional, psychological, and spiritual way. And does the prayer book, does the RC door, do the tefillot in the prayer book help us to manage that conflict? Because I know we all have it, right? All the time, every day, um, we are in conflict with ourselves or with another person in our family, especially people that we love so deeply and dearly. Uh, so that is what we're going to do today, and I'm going to actually turn it over to Kenna Rafi, who's going to introduce our first tefillah on page 101 in your cedarim. 101, the second paragraph sh sh that begins with the word shahar, which is dawn, um, as a way of introducing more fully our theme for today. Thank you, Rabbi. So if you look at this prayer and you look at the third line, it speaks to some of these inner conflicts that Rabbi Cameron was talking about. It says, I am odd and confused. And how many of us sometimes feel this conflicting chaos of emotions within us? So the question that we ask you to ponder as we pray this tefillah together is how do we cultivate our inner world so that it is a stronghold of resilience and not this cauldron of chaos? The prayer, if we take a look at the text, and as we sing along, we encourage you to take a look at the text, it recalls, it reminds us, maybe we don't need to have certainty to have inner refuge. Maybe the ability to hold different, even conflicting ideas within ourselves, for example, love, pain, awe, confusion, maybe that is how we build our inner resilience. So we invite you to think about these questions as we join together in Shachar Avakeshcha. Oh, 
dawn, I seek you, my refuge, my haven. Morning and evening to you I pray. Though facing your greatness, I am awed and confused, for you know already what I would think and say. We turn to page 103. Familiar as we are with Birchot HaShachar, Morning Blessings, a series of blessings of gratitude and appreciation for the manifold and myriad gifts that we are given in our lives. Um, we're going to pause at a few of the specific brachot of Birchot HaShachar as we go through all of the Birchot HaShachar uh, uh, as a way of thinking about this sense of conflict and how the words of this tefillah may give us insight into how we might manage in body, in mind, and in spirit uh, when we face conflict. So we're going to rise on page 103, Birchot HaShachar. Baruch Adonai Elohimu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lasechbi Vibina Lechavchin Bein Yom Uben Laila Baruch Atah Adonai Elohimu Melech HaOlam Shasani Betsalmo Praised are you, Lord, our God, who opens up our eyes to be able to see, who gives sight to the blind. There are many ways in which we can see, with our eyes, of course, but also with hindsight, insight, and mind sight. Perhaps this prayer is inviting us to think about all the ways in which we can use sight, both physical and internal, to be able to manage conflict. What is it that we see? And then beyond what we see, what do we experience? <laughs> Praise are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who clothes the naked. We don't pay attention sometimes to the actual Hebrew, malbish arumim. Arumim, naked, it comes from actually Breshit from Genesis in the opening chapters when Adam and Eve are naked and they are not at all ashamed or em embarrassed. And then they eat from the fruit of the tree and they notice their nakedness and what's the first thing they do? They cover themselves. Perhaps nakedness here is speaking less about our clothing than about our vulnerabilities. And oftentimes, when we are in conflict with someone, we want to make sure that nobody sees us in a vulnerable state. And so we stay hard and fast to a position that may actually not be a position that is true for us or for the other person. Can we be vulnerable in our relationships with one another, Malbish Arumim. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Mahatir Asurim And so we say Amen. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Matir Asurim Praised are you, Lord our God, who releases the bound, Asurim, to be bound up, to be constricted, to be tight. Sometimes you notice it most in your physical being when you are confronting somebody that challenges you and you feel it in your kishkas. You feel it in your gut, in your stomach, in your restrictions of your chest. So what I would invite us all to do right now is take a very, very deep breath and let it out. 
and try to relax into this moment. Let go of anything that may be hanging on in a moment of pain and confusion of restriction. Breathe it all out as we continue with the rest of our tefillah 104. <laughs> as we jump to uh, Baruch She'amar, which is found on page 122. Before Baruch She'amar, Cantor Rafi is going to share a brief introduction to the meaning behind the tefillah. So this uh, tefillah has a, um, has a particular line in it that we'd like you to pay attention to. Baruch Merachem. Blessed is the one who shows compassion. Blessed is the one who is compassionate. So we invite you to think about the question, and this time when we have a uh, divided political climate, we have a lot of uh, conflict in our surroundings, in our environment, how do we approach people with whom we disagree? How do we approach people with whom we disagree? And just as God, merachem, just as God shows that compassion, how do we, Merachem, how do we be that compassionate and show that compassion to all creatures, not just the ones with whom we're on the same page or with whom we agree? We invite you to think about this. It's a difficult question as we continue. Baruch she'amar v'haya ha'olam Baruch hu, Baruch Amen. You may be seated. So a question for you. When you are in conflict with another, when you are in disagreement with another, what might be, what midah, what character trait might be helpful to you um, in that moment of conflict? It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> yes, Ma unusual, Maxine, because you're usually quite shy <laughs> and reserved. So for you to raise your hand in the middle of a service comes as a bit of a shock. But yes, Maxine, what, what character trait, what quality might be helpful in the midst of conflict? Take a breath. Take a breath, indeed, to slow down and breathe, maybe to experience a little bit of patience with yourself and the other. Anybody else? Yes, David. Humility. Humility. Excellent. That's ex in fact, David, the one that I want to talk about this morning. 
Um, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Satnov teaches us, always seek to learn wisdom from everyone to recognize your failings and correct them. In doing so, you will learn to stop thinking about your virtues and you will take your mind off your friend's faults. Hmm. Seek to learn wisdom from other people and in doing so, we'll stop thinking about our virtues and take our mind off others' faults. The melody that we're going to sing on page 125 at the top of the page for the prayer Romamu reflects a practice that we might engage in in everyday conversation and whenever we encounter another. It's a call and response. What is a call and response? It means that we are encouraged to listen and then mirror what we hear. At the end, we come together and lift our voices as the prayer Romamu says, to lift up. We cannot lift up, we can lift up our voices alone, but think about what it means to lift up our voices in community, in dialogue with another person. When we can learn to listen to another and hear them and learn from them as they might hear and learn from us, then together our voices are elevated towards God. Page 125, Romamu. Turning to page 141, as we conclude almost our Psuche de Zimra service, the part of the service that warms us up for everything about to come. Sometimes the answer to conflict is just letting go. Let it go. Just feel gratitude for what's in front of us. We don't have to intellectualize, overthink, overanalyze all the time. <laughs> we just feel it in our bodies celebrate, invite joy in. And in fact, joy is central to our tradition. As Rabbi Nachman of Bratislav says, nothing is as liberating as joy. Nothing is as liberating as joy. It frees the mind and fills it with tranquility. A nice antidote to conflict. So hopefully you'll feel the joy and join in on page 141, top of the page. Hallelujah, 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 
Yeshua. Kol haneshama te hallelujah. Kol haneshama te hallelujah. 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 rise as we turn it to page 140 actually we didn't have to rise yet but it's okay 147 <laughs> shochenad as we begin our shachrit service yai lai lai 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 Sharim tit halal, ukivrei tzadikim tit barach, uvishon chasidim tit romam, uvkerev kedoshim tit kadash, uvmakalot rivevot amcha beit Yisrael. Sheken chovat kol yitzrim lefanecha, Adonai lo heinu velo yavatinu v'imotinu, lehodot lehalel leshabach lefa'er, לרומם להדר לברך לאלה ולקלס על כל דברי שירות לתשפחות דוד בן ישי עבדך משיחך ישתבח שמך לעד מלכנו ברכות והודעות מעתה ועד עולם ברוך אתה אדוני אל מלך כתול בתשפחות אל ההודעות אדון הנפלאות הבוחר בשירי זמרה מלך אל חי העולמים Yit kadal ve yit kadash Shmei rabba be'alma Divra kirutei Ve'amlich malchutei Ve'chai yachon v'yom mechon Chai edech v'bet Yisrael O'gala v'gala V'zman kariv Ve'yimenu amen Yehi shmei rabba Page 149, we call our, bring ourselves to prayer as a community with the Baruch Hu.
may be seated. We continue on page 150 silently all the way through to uh, the top of 154. <laughs> As we know, love is more uh, than ab about, it's more about emotions oftentimes than it is about actions. And even in the face of discord and disagreement, true love is to be able to express the love that we embody for another person. Ahava Rabbah on page 154 is indicative of the kind of love that God has for us and that we are in turn supposed to have for God and for each other. And the emphasis here is on the second word of that prayer, Ahava Rabbah, the Rabbah part. What is Rabbah in Hebrew? It means much. So it's not enough just to love. Our love has to be ever-ending, deep, full, full-bodied, intense. That's the kind of love that Ahava Rabbah is inviting us to engage in with our loved ones. Perhaps contemplate on how we might be able to express even deeper love, more love, embodied love, the Rabbah part of love, as Cantor Rafi leads us in this beautiful melody written by Cantor Rafi on 154.
we're going to gather our tzitzit seat if we're wearing a talit. Um, the four corners of the tzitzit seat representing the disparate parts of our own lives, the yin and yang of the world together making a circle, positive and negative, holding each other darkness and light. The essence of the Shema is to live in tension with another and still yet be unified collectively together as the Shema indicates. And as we join together in the Shema in just a moment, we're going to invite you to inhale and then exhale on each word of the Shema. And also inviting you when you inhale to take in, draw in, accept the other. And when you exhale, to share yourself with the other. Baruch ata Adonai, ha-mokher be'amo Yisrael, be'ahava. Shema Adonai Elohechem, Amen. the edge of the sea. That's where the Israelites found themselves frightened, fearful, filled with anxiety, wanting to turn back. At the edge of the sea, how many times do we find ourselves in the same place? At the edge of the sea, raging waters in front of us from conflict with another, and we want to run and hide, we want to turn back. We don't want to confront. We don't want to do what Nachshon did, which is to jump in. Sink or swim is the feeling. And yet, the response to Nachshon's jumping in was that the sea split, that the waters fell back, that the raging stopped, and that the possibility of saving grace existed in that moment. Micha Mocha reminds us that when we are standing at the edge of the sea, the best thing sometimes to do is to just jump in. We invite you to jump in by responding in the echoes that begin this melody.
שיבחו גאולים, שיר החדשה, שיבחו גאולים לשמחה, על שפת היום. מי כמוך באלים אדוני, מי כמוך נדר בקודש, לא רק תגילות, עושה פלא, עושה פלא. in preparation for the Amidah, which in a moment is going to begin on page 159. We're going to join together through the Kedusha on 161, and then we are going to conclude silently. <laughs> We begin with the opening phrase Adonai Svatai Tiftach on page 159. Thank 
חיי מתים ברחמים רבים, צומך נופלים ברופא חולים, הוא מתיר עשורים, הוא מקיים אמונתו לשני עפר, מי כמוך בעל גיבורות, הוא מדום אלך, מלך ממית ומחיה, הוא מצמיח ישוע. ונאמן אתה לאחיות מתים, ברוך אתה אדוני מחיי המתים. נקדש את שמך בעולם כשם שמקדישים אותו בשמי מרום, ככתוב על יד נביאיך וקרא זה אל זה ואמר קדוש 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 ארנאי צבא מלוך על הארץ כבודו קדוש 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 ארנאי צבאות מלוך על הארץ כבודו אז בקול רעש גדול אדיר וחזק משמיעים קול מתנשאים לעומת צרפים לעומתם ברוך יומנו ברוך כבוד אדוני ממקומו ברוך כבוד אדוני ממקומו ממקום לך מלכנו תופיע ותמלוך עלינו כי שפחך אלוהינו מפינו לא יומוש לעולם ועד כי אל מלך גדול וגדול שאתה ברוך אתה אדוני האל
So we've arrived at the Torah service, and the purpose of our Torah reading is not just to connect to the wisdom and the tradition of our past, but to actually see in the Torah uh, pertinent lessons for the present. How does the Torah continue to speak to us in generation after generation, age and after age, in a way that helps guide the process of our living lives in rich and meaningful ways. So we're going to take out the Torah, as is the tradition in our Zamru service. Um, we are not going to read all of the Torah portion this morning. We're just going to read um, a few of the first handful of psukim verses in the Torah portion of Korach. But within even these few verses, uh, Cantor Rafi and I believe they are um, heavily laden with great wisdom for all of us to be able to uh, find which are uh, ways in which we can enrich our life. So we are going to rise on page 168 as we open up our ark and take out our Torah and then jump into our Torah reading. Vayehi bin Tzoharon vayomer Moshe Kuma Adonai veyachutsu oivecha veyanusu metzanecha mipanecha ki mitzion teitzei Torah ki mitzion teitzei Torah udevar If you are at home, we invite you to join into the Zoom room at this time for our Torah service so that you can equally participate in our service. And Seth is going to place the Zoom room ID into the screen so that you can join in, or it may already be there for you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad
So you may be seated if you want to follow along in a humash, which we have on both tables as you entered into our beautiful Wise Garden Sanctuary. You can follow along on page 860 in your humashim. We're going to be reading the first aliyah up to 862 divided into three. Now, as is also the tradition of the Zamru services, we don't give out um, individual aliyot, we give out collective group aliyot. And the way we give out these aliyot, as you may be seated, is we invite people um, either here in the Weiss Garden or on our Zoom, um, if there are people in the Zoom, um, to listen carefully to what each of the aliyot represent, perhaps. And if the aliyah speaks to where you are at presently in your life, then we would invite you to stand and come forward and kind of gather either over here or close to Ofer, um, making sure that you're safe and uh, participate in the aliyot. So the first aliyah, we're dealing with Korach's rebellion. Imagine Korach's rebellion is an inner rebellion within ourselves. Sometimes we know what we need to do. We know the path forward what we are being called to do, but something within us, oftentimes our Yetzir Hara, rises up and puts up a roadblock. Fear, doubt, resistance, they prevent us from following our truth. So, if this relates to a moment which you are experiencing right now, if you find yourself facing some inner resistance to do something that you know you need to do with the path in front of you, I would invite you to stand up, um, either in your seats or come forward over to where uh, Ofer has set up the um, Aliyah, and this first Aliyah is for you. All of those who know that there is some roadblock in front of them, fear, doubt, resistance, preventing them from following their truth. It's amazing that wow. all of you know exactly where you are <laughs> and need to be and where you need to go, or you're not quite ready to be so vulnerable as Maxine right. and Maxine and David are. <laughs> Thank you. So collectively together, as you imagine that you are kissing the Torah, that uh, Ofer is going to be reading and taking strength and perseverance from that strength. Thank you, Neil, in joining. The first aliyah collectively, Echad, Shtaim, Shalosh. Baruch et Adonai Hamborach. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. Amen. Amen. Vaikaha Korach, Ben Yitzhar, Ben Kehat, Ben Levi, Vedatan Vaviram, Ben Eliav, Veon Ben Pehelet, Ben Ereuven, Vayakumulif Ne Moshe, Vanashimi Ben Israel, חמישים ומאתיים נשיאי עדה קריאי מועד אנשי שם ויקהלו על משה ועל אהרון ויאמרו עליהם רב לכם כי כל העדה כולם קדושים ובתוכם אדוני ומדוע תתנשאו על קהל אדוני. אחד, שתיים, שלוש. ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר נתנו תורת אמת, וחי אלוהים נתן בתוכנו. ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהים התורה. Amen. So to David, Maxine, Maxine, Neil, and anybody who is on Zoom and anybody else who um, felt it in your heart but were not um, willing to stand up and come forward, we say to you, 
May the one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless each and every one of you. May you find the inner strength to navigate the resistance and move forward with all of the courage and resilience that you know that you can muster. May God always be at your side and in your heart as we say amen. Thank you. For our second Aliyah, we turn to Kanner Rafi. So in the second Aliyah, we see that Moshe turns to God, uh, being faced with this rebellion from Korach. M Moshe falls on his face and turns to God to be the uh, arbiter of what to do next. So sometimes in order, in our lives, in order to move forward, we need to let go of our egos and say, we need God's support. I need God's support right now. God, help me. That expression that we use, God help me, this means I can't do this without knowing that you're with me, God. So stand up. We invite you to stand up if there's something in your life at this very moment, in this time, for which you are seeking strength and the presence of God to guide you forward. And if that is the case, you can come forward. Collectively, our group that is seeking strength and presence from God, we say to you, um, you'll uh, start the bracha, Echad Shtaim Shalosh. Baruch Adonai Hamborach Leolam Ba'ed. Amen. Verse 4, page 861. Amen. And the Yishmah Moshe, that I can't do what I crave, I love that I shall give her boy, I crave, I love that I this chimu alehen keto red leaf ne adonai mahar ve haya haish asha yiv har adonai hu hakadosh rav lachem ne levi hajj time shalosh Amen. Mishaberach Avotenu Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov Imotenu Sar Rivcha Rechel May the one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless each one of you who have come forward seeking the presence of God in your life. Um, the famous Hasidic statement that says, where is God? Wherever it is that we let God in. God is within each and every one of you. May you always find that search fruitful, and may the divine fill your presence as he fills your life, as we say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Before our third Aliyah, there are so many things that we're celebrating today, but one in particular is we would like to invite Shana and Anthony to come forward. Woo! Shane and Anthony were just wed a couple of weeks ago in New York City. Unfortunately, given the um, state of COVID, they could not have the entire congregation that they wanted to have, or I should say Maxine wanted to have the whole congregation. <laughs> I'm not sure that Shane and Anthony wanted to have the whole congregation. 
Um, but the fact is that it doesn't matter how many are there to celebrate. What matters is the celebration itself. And we want to extend to the two of you um, prayers of health, of happiness, and of blessing as you begin your married life together in this post-COVID world where through the two of you, um, all possibilities, all potentialities, all of the future hope and dreams, not to put any pressure on the two of you, um, <laughs> that humanity has because in each and every marriage, the possibility of a better future rests with the love that the two of you share with one another. Um, that love as we expressed a little bit earlier in the prayer, Ahava Rabbah, that talks about our deep love. There's one line in there that I want to share with each of you, Shana and Anthony. It's called Chemla Gedola. Chemla Gedola. And what is Chemla Gedola? It means enormous amount of compassion. There are going to be moments in your life where you're going to look at one another and say, what the heck am I doing with him or her? <laughs> How did this get to the be, right? That's just natural, that the love you feel for today is going to be like one of these things, constantly moving forward, but rising and falling with moments of peak and moments of valley. And in those moments, both of peaks and valleys, chemla gdola, deep and compassionate, abiding love for one another. May you hold each other today as you hold each other 50 years from now, and may your love be an inspiration for all who are blessed to come into your presence and know you and learn from you. Um, I want to share a special blessing, and then I'm going to come over and give you a closer blessing with my mask on. May God, who blessed our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel and Leah, bless this groom and bride, Shana and Anthony. May God bring joy to you as God did to the first couple in the Garden of Eden. May God help you to build a home based on the spirit of love, trust, faith, and peace, where love and companionship abide within the home you establish. And may it be a home imbued with the values and teachings of our tradition. May you both grow together in health and contentment. And let us say, Amen. Before, before Cantor Rafi sings Dodi Lee, which is a song of love for a husband and wife from the uh, love poetry of Song of Songs, I'm going to come over and bless the two of you. May the Lord bless you both and guard you. May the Lord shine his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. May you always feel that inner light, and may you bring that inner light of your life and love into the world as we say Amen. Amen. Amen.
Like the lilies of the valleys, may your love be effervescent, sweet, and blessed for your long lives to come. A mazal tov to your family who are here, those who may be watching in New York, wherever it is that they are. Shane and Anthony, a long, full, blessed life ahead. Mazal tov. Mazel tov. For our third Aliyah, if you go back to your text on page 861, Korah says something very interesting to the people of uh, the community of, of the Israelites. He says he calls Egypt a land flowing with milk and honey. And we all know that a land flowing wi with milk and honey is not Egypt at all, but what is it? It's the promised land, exactly. Datan and Aviram, who describe Egypt as a land flowing with milk and honey, turn to a place that was narrow, Egypt, of narrowness, and turn it into something that it wasn't. Oftentimes, we make something positive into a negative. And we know that's not a healthy quality for us. Just as Rebbe Nachman taught us that joy is liberating, we need to embrace the goodness that it's presented to us. There are so many things that are good in our lives, and it's been a very difficult year <coughs> to sometimes focus on those things that are good. One of the things that our community is uh, paying attention to today is all of the joy and the goodness that comes in the celebration of momentous moments in our lives, particularly those of graduations. We have many people in our community who are graduating or have graduated this year. I just was actually witness last week or this past Sunday, <coughs> excuse me, too. Um, graduates of LA Hebrew High, where one third, <coughs> excuse me, one third of the graduating class were members of Shomri Torah Synagogue. One third. And one of those individuals of that graduating class is here today, Yael Bright. Yeah. Woo! So, Yael, I'm going to invite you to come forward if you're willing to represent your. Um, Hebrew High class and all of the graduates um, who are celebrating this significant moment in their lives. And I also, Yael, um, if your shoulders are large enough and strong enough to bear, I also want to at this time honor and recognize our incredible youth community at Shomrei Torah Synagogue. And not only did our USY win Chapter of Excellence this year, but we had three U.S. wires who equally achieved excellence. Kobe Vishager was awarded the prestigious Rabbi Edward Tenenbaum U.S. Wire of the Year. Kolakavod to Kobe. And Lucas Rosen for a Veterans Day Lounge. Lexi Yagobi for a Yom HaShoah drive through And Dan Lahavi for a special Passover Lounge. Each one of these young people brought significant moments of education and celebration to our community. So, Yael, with those <laughs> shoulders of yours, which are not so large, but I'm sure you can hold up a lot, um, all of the graduates of this synagogue, of Hebrew High, of the celebratory moments for USY, we're going to invite you to come forward for this third Aliyah. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Adonai Hamvarach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim. Venatam Lanu Et Torato. Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah. Amen. Amen. Vayomer Moshe El Korach. שימונה בני לוי, המעט מכם כבדיל, אלוהי ישראל אתכם, 
מידעת ישראל להקריב אתכם אליו לעבוד את עבודת משכן אדוני ולעמוד לפני העדה לשרתם ויקרב אותך ואת כל אחיך בני לוי איתך וביקשתם גם כהונה לכן אתה וכל עדתך הנועדים על אדוני ואהרון מהו כי תלינו עליו וישלח משה לקרוא לדתן ולאבירם בני אליאב ויאמרו לא נעלה המעט כי העליתנו מארץ זהבת חלב ודבש להמיתנו במדבר כי תשתרר עלינו גם ישתרר ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר נתן לנו תורת אמת וחיי עולם נתן בתוכנו ברוך אתה אדוני נותן התורה אמן to all of our don't go yet um yael you've got more work to do for all of our graduates including yourself um who, by the way, is going to Columbia, what, where are you going? Columbia, Tel Aviv. Philippines. Columbia, Tel Aviv um, wow. for uh, school next year. Kol to you. We say to you, along with all of our graduates, um, and all of our graduates from high school are going to receive a little um, card in the mail, a Tfilat Haderach card, so that your journeys will always remind you of your home, Shomrei Torah Synagogue, and the community that helped raise you to the young woman who you are. And by extension, by the way, Yael, I want to offer this tefillah haderach to your parents, Shelley and David. Um, for many, many, many long years, the Brights have been members of this community and contributed immensely to the well-being of our congregation and the success of our community. And the Brights are moving or have moved partially, fully um, to Bakersfield, and um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from the peanut gallery over there. Um, and uh, though you are going to be uh, leaving this community, know that you are never leaving this community, that hopefully uh, you will always feel connected to us as we feel connected to you, and you will come back often. So we say to the Brights and to all of our graduates this prayer of safe journeys wherever it is that you go. יהי רצון מפניך אדוני אלוהינו ולא יעבותינו שתוכלינו לשלום ותצידנו לשלום ותדוכנו לשלום ותגיענו למחו וחצינו לחיים ולשמחה ולשלום ותחזירנו לבתינו לשלום ותצילנו מכף כל אויה וערב וליסטים חיות רעות בדרך ומקרים מנהל פירענות המתרגשות לבוא לעולם נשלח ברכה וכל מעשה ידינו ובנינינו חיינו חסד ורחמים ועיניך ועינינו כל רעינו ותשמע כל תחנוננו כי על שומע תפילה ותחנו נתה ברוך אתה אדוני שומע תפילה and one additional thing, Yael, before you go, um, Cantor Rafi is going to lead us in Shehechianu for you and all of our graduates in this community. <laughs> Mazel tov to you, Yael, and all of our graduates. Thank you for standing up there so long. <laughs> um, um, so uh, Seth is going to share a very brief montage of some of our graduates and a photo of the Hebrew High graduates at this time. 
while we hand out the study uh, sheets that we're going to be engaged in um, in a minute. And we want to once again invite all of those who are live streaming to join in on Zoom so you can be part of our learning together. The texts that I am passing out, Seth is going to share on the screen after the montage. Unfortunately, we don't have two videos, so uh, you'll have to see it later. But Ready. Ready. who also graduated. Um, Mazel Tov, congratulations. Do you know where you're headed? Yes. Where? Uh, Cal Lutheran. Cal oh, we have to talk. My daughter went there and loved it. She's a graduate of Cal Lutheran. All right, Eliana, after services, Mazel Tov Mazel to tov. you as well. And may your journey, Eliana, be one filled with God's presence. And may this community also stay with you in your life ahead. Mazel Tov to you and Mazel Tov to all of our graduates. So um, we are going to do a little bit of learning together, and then we're going to put our Safer Torah away and conclude our services. Um, as the um, weather is warm, I'm going to, I hope it's okay with all of you, <laughs> take my jacket off. Much better. Okay, so we are looking at conflict, confronting conflict, the challenges that we all face in dialogue with people oftentimes who we love um, and end up sometimes feeling very frustrated in those conversations because of the tensions that arise when we're dealing with differences of opinions and ways in which we see the world, and there's so much diversity right now and so much unfortunate negative dialogue amongst people, particularly in the realm of politics. And it doesn't have to be that way. And I think the texts that I want to look with you at with you today perhaps uh, share some insights that we can gain from our tradition on how we might approach uh, conflict. I know there are people on the Zoom room. Uh, Seth, is it possible for us to be able to see on the screen so I can see who it is that's there. It may just be a couple people, it may be 
Oh, I see Rachel and Judy. And hi, Rachel and Judy. It's nice to have you with us. I'm sorry that you can't be here in person, but I'm glad you're here with us to uh, learn together. So conflict. If you look at the uh, top where it says Pirkei Avot 517, every argument that is for the sake of heaven is destined to endure. If it's not for the sake of heaven, it's not destined to endure. What's an example of an argument for the sake of heaven? The arguments of Hillel and Shammai. What is an example of an argument not for the sake of heaven? The argument of Korah and his followers. So there's two different types of arguments, one for the sake of heaven, one for not for the sake of heaven. But that's not defined, so I'm going to ask all of you, what do you think is the, definite dif the differences between those two? What is an argument for the sake of heaven, and what is an argument that is not for the sake of heaven? And Seth, you're going to have to help me out because if Judy or uh, Rachel want to say something, uh, yeah, and then and then Seth will just you'll have you speak. Um, and if anybody else here wants to say something, I can see you. So please raise your hand and join in. What do you think is the difference between an argument that is for the sake of heaven and one that is not for the sake of heaven? John. I think it. I think it has to do with uh, who, who gets the honor. When you say who, like if, if the if the honor goes to God, where the argument is won, then it's probably for the sake of heaven. If the okay. honor goes to me, then it's probably interesting. So who gets the honor in the argument? Me, the individual, or is it for something greater potentially for God? Good. What else? Other thoughts? Well, what is an argument that that represents Korach? What's Korach's type of argument? Why does he argue against God? What's he looking for? He's looking for honor. What else is he looking for? Power. Yes, honor and power. So perhaps arguments that relate to our wanting to gain greater honor and power are not arguments for the sake of heaven. Whereas the arguments between Hillel and Shammai, what was the nature of those arguments? What were they wrestling about? Matters of doing God's will, of trying to figure out how to live in this world in the way in which God would want us and desire us to live. So maybe that's the difference between those arguments. Uh, any other thoughts between um, arguments L'shem Shemaim and arguments not L'shem Shemaim? Okay, then let's take a look at the next text. Redeeming relevance, Numbers chapter 3, Korach and the limits of popular government. The practical difference is that Hillel and Shammai were not asking rhetorical questions and walking away from each other. They argued back and forth to express their perspective and to hear what the other had to say. When Korach opened the discussion by making rhetorical swipes at Moshe, the chances for edification or even resolution were certainly quite slim. When Datan and Aviram refused to speak to Moshe, the chances disappeared altogether. So from this second text, do you, ask, do you have copies over there? No? So here in this second text, we learn that it's not about the content of the dispute or the agreement. What is it? Not the content, but what is going on here? The, me the method. The Correct. method, exactly. What's the method of argumentation, the difference between Hillel and Shammai's and Korach's and Datan and Aviram's? Yeah, Maxine. Very good. Who listens? Yeah, Hillel and Shammai, even in their disagreement, they're willing to listen to the positions and the opinions of the other. Korach, Datan, and Aviram are not interested in hearing the other side. Do you ever find that you're talking with somebody, arguing with somebody, where they're not listening to you? Do you ever find that you're not listening to another person when they are arguing or talking to you? Right, something as simple 
as noticing, paying attention to the other person saying that there might be some wisdom here, something that I can learn from the other person. So it's the manner. One of them is a lack of listening. Anything else this text tells us about the practical differences, the methodology of why the argumentations of Hillel and Shammai were better than the ones of Korach and Datan and Abiram? Yeah, John. So I think in their argument, they're talking to each other, looking to get a response from each other, whereas the arguments of Korach are talking to one, but really looking to get responses from the public, points from the people, rather than actually engaging the person. So what um, John said is, with Hillel and Shammai, they're really looking to try to uh, gain understanding from one another, whereas... Korach and Datan and Aviram are not interested in dialogue with Moshe. What they're trying to do is rally up the people, like almost like demagogues, where they're trying to create a state, perhaps of totalitarianism, if we wanted to add a political element to this, where they're just looking to gain power and approach the people for that power, and they're not interested, actually, in engaging Moshe in trying to make whatever is happening better for all individuals. Excellent. Any other thoughts? Maxine. Something, some, something as simple as just noticing the physiology of the human body, the face, two ears and one mouth, because we have a tendency to spend more of our time using the mouth than the ears, talking as opposed to listening. Judy Groner, yes. When is an argument an argument and not a speech? If, if you have closed ears, you can't engage in a discussion, so it's really not an argument. It's just about saying your point of view, with, as others said, without listening, to another point of view, so how can you argue with someone when there's no cross-conversation? Very good. So why do we do that? Because we all find ourselves right in those moments. Why do we shut another person out? Why do we have a hard time listening? Why do you have a hard time listening? Yeah, David. What's that? Ah, we have a hard time listening when somewhere deep inside we know that we might be wrong and are not ready to admit that. Why else do we have a hard time listening? Yeah, Ignacio. Yeah, because we just don't care about what the other person has to say. And not caring about what the other person has to say says a lot about how we view that other individual. Not how we should view the individual, but how we do view the other individual. Excellent. David. Can't hear you. Arguing with God, meaning ah, okay. And where do those arguments go? So sometimes when we ask God for questions about why things are happening to us, why a certain situation is occurring, what is it that we're looking for? Are we actually looking for a response from God? Do we expect God to say, well, David, let me explain to you what's going on here. Let me show you the larger picture. Or are we really looking for an answer within? Right, because we know we're probably not going to, well, we could hear that voice, but that voice is not the voice that necessarily is thunderous from the heavens, but maybe it's the still small voice that is within each of us that has the answer to those very questions. Or if not the answer to those questions, the ability to respond to whatever is going on in our lives. Let's um, take a look at... Um, the next text, which is the, at the bottom of the page, page the Kli Yakar. But to understand the Kli Yakar, we have to understand where he's referencing in Breshit. So in Breshit, we learn God said, let there be an expanse, a rakia, 
in the midst of the water, that it may separate water from water. So this is the very beginning of the creation of the world. And God is saying, let there be a rakia within the upper waters and the lower waters. And the word to describe that division between the upper waters and the lower waters is rakia. So God made this rakia expanse, and it separated the water which was below the expanse from the waters which was above the expanse. And God called the expanse sky or shamayim. He didn't call it rakia, which he could have. But God created, the Torah says there's another word, which is shamayim. And that's going to be important as we read the Kleyakar. God did not want that it should be called with the name firmament or rakia or expanse, since that name indicates division and disagreement, as that word appears later on in the book of Exodus when it says, and they hammered or flattened uh, yiraka'u, the same Hebrew word, the gold into thin plates for that which was to cover the earth. So in Genesis, when they're building the Mishkan, the tabernacle, they are creating these gold plates to divide, to separate. And so this word raka or rakia connotes separation and division, like in Genesis and like in Exodus. He continues, since any, turn the page, rakia is a covering that separates between two, between two things, God did not want that the sky should be called rakia or firmament which indicates a cover that separates and divides between brothers. So instead it was called with the name heavens, shamayim, which indicates peace. Why does shamayim, the word shamayim, indicate peace? Since shamayim is composed of two words, fire, ash, and water, mayim, who made peace between themselves and joined together, and from them, was created skies. And this is what the rabbis of blessed memory state. Any disagreement that's for the sake of heaven's shamayim, which means to say that a disagreement whose purpose is peace, as is the teaching of the name shamayim, this then is easy to understand. So there's a couple concepts that I want to look at. Number one is what does it mean for aish and mayim to be at peace? Shamayim represents those two words, aish and mayim. When we think of Aish and Mayim, fire and water, what comes to mind? Yeah, they're opposites, right? They cannot live together because what happens to the fire with water? It extinguishes it, exactly. So isn't it interesting? Yeah, Seth. Zoom room. Rachel, please. Oh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Sorry, now, uh, what I was going to comment was actually with your earlier prompt, but I can tie it into what you just said as far as why we um, may not listen um, is because of uh, maybe also just pride and presumption of knowledge. But um, with this, it's so beautiful what you're just saying and sharing because I think of, you know, um, what we just said. Uh, there's there's uh, this uh, extinguishment that otherwise happens, but to think that these can coexist is to imply even in you know having uh, a, a points that are in such opposition, there's an intentionality to try to coexist. Um, and so yeah, I just um, I, I was finding that really powerful um, and a different kind of idea, but parallel here is um, the fact that here we could have people all over and we're still coming together thanks to, you know, um, um, really skilled individuals doing tech like Seth and Steve, thank you. And, and here I could be all the way in Pennsylvania and others who are watching on stream can be together. So I think that's really powerful. Um, and I'm gonna take this last second to give a shout of uh, Mazel Tov to the, the, the graduates and the newlyweds. And thank you for, again, uh, letting me be a part and even wishing me happy birthday after it's been a year being with you all uh, last night. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> Rachel, thank you. Two um, profound comments. The second one is that technology, perhaps there's a hidden message in the technology which draws us together even at great distance. And maybe the lesson there is 
that even with great distance in terms of ideas between us and our fellow human beings, that we still need to be drawn together, even in our, in our disagreements. And I think you said it so eloquently, Rachel, in your first comment about coexistence, that if God created the universe in such a way that two opposites must coexist together in order for there to be peace, what does that say about how we need to interact with people who we staunchly disagree with? I, oftentimes, we spend much of our energies, especially on social media, reading the things that we agree with and not taking note of the things that we disagree with because there's nothing that we could possibly learn from those with whom, whom we are in disagreement. But if there is going to be peace in this world, then those things must coexist. Yeah, Judy. I love this reading where um, instead of using the word rakira, rakia of, of separation, that day and night and fire and water cannot coexist because one cancels the other out. And yet there is a continuous circle of a return that day turns to night, night turns to day. And yet they are not separated as the word would have explained. But we, when we look up to the heavens, as a continuation of, of water to sky, that we are not in juxtaposition of opposites, but in this tandem relationship of one evolves into the other. It's not an argument, it's not a fight, but it is, it is cohesion. Beautiful, thank you for that. Any other thoughts about opposites, fire and water, and the necessity to be in conflict with another, but unified in that conflict. Okay, um, we're gonna wrap up. I'm just gonna quickly read these two texts to uh, share the wisdom of Mark Elaine Wachnin uh, from the Burnt Book. The Talmud says of Talmudic discussions, the words of one and the words of the other are the living words of God. And the assumption, by the way, in that statement is that the words of one are in disagreement with the words of the other. And yet both of them are the words of the living God. What is the nature of truth, right? That's what this is asking us. How do we view truth? Do we view truth as only what we hold to be true, what we believe to be accurate, how we understand and see the world? Or is truth both the way that we see the world and the opposite way that we see the world, the way somebody else understands it. This statement should be seen as conditional. If there are words of one and words of the other, then they are the words of the living God, and as a result are living words. Only when we hold fast to opposition, to the truths of another, and carry them in our hearts, can there they be words of the living God? As long as we refuse to accept the positions of another as potentialities of truth, then we're going to live in disagreement, disharmony. Finally, Rabbi Sachs of blessed memory, truth on earth is not, nor can be the whole truth. It is limited, not comprehensive, particular, not universal. When two propositions conflict, it is not necessarily because one is true and the other false. It may be and often is that each represents a different perspective on reality, an alternative way of structuring order no more and no less commensurable than a Shakespeare sonnet, a Michelangelo painting, or a Schubert sonata. In heaven there is truth, on earth there are truths. Therefore, each culture has something to contribute. Each person knows something no one else does. The sages say, who is wise? One who learns from all men. The wisest is not one who knows himself wiser than others. He is one who knows all men have some share of the truth and is willing to learn from them. For none of us knows all the truth, and each of us knows some of it. As we leave today's Zamru service, 
both the prayers in the Sidur that remind us how to connect body, mind, and soul to conflict so that we can approach the other with more compassion, love, and openness. So may the Torah and the lessons of Korah and Hillel and Shammai remind us that our own truth is very limited, that the way we see the world is valid for ourselves, not necessarily for anybody else, and that the way they see the world is valid for them. And only when we can take their positions and our positions and find a way for them to coexist can there be peace on earth. May we find a way to be able to do that in our lives as we say Shabbat Shalom and Amen. We're going to um, go back to our uh, Sidor and put our Torah away and conclude our service. Uh, we are putting our Torah away on page 184. So we invite everybody to rise for Eitz Chaim Ki. to continue standing for, no we're not, we're going to sit for a minute, um, Ein Kelo Heinu, page 204. Ein Kelo Heinu, Ein Kadon Heinu, Ein Kemalkeinu, Ein Kemoshienu, Mi Kelo Heinu, Mi Kadon Heinu, Mi Kemalkeinu, Mi Kemoshienu. No de lelo heinu, no de la donehinu, no de le malkeinu, no de la moshienu, baru hello heinu, baru ha donehinu, baru malkeinu, baru moshienu, atahu elo heinu, atahu adonehinu, atahu malkeinu, atahu moshienu, atahu shaitiru avotei. We rise for Alenu, page 205. Alenu le shabeach la adon hakol La teit gedula li yotzer bereishit Shelo asanu kegoye ha'aratzot Velo tzaman kemishpachot ha'adama
כתוב בתורתך, אדוני ימלוך לעולם ועד, ונאמר, והיה אדוני למלך על כל הארץ. ביום ההוא, ביום ההוא, יהיה אדוני אחד, ושמו, ושמו, ושמו. Remembering now at this time those whose yard sites are this week, the 2nd of Tammuz to the 8th of Tammuz, Bernice Alfaso, Nathan Allweiss, Israel Allweiss, Ralph Black, Goldie Botwinick, Ruby Bubis, Libby Burstein, Joseph Cohen, Samuel Cohen, Carl Dubinsky, Philip Esterson, Elisa Feldman, Ida Gordon, Robert Greenberg, Sharia Karadi, Stanley Levin, Jacob Lichten, Esther Messerman, Marianne Milstein, Jerry Moss, Irving Nachamson, Phyllis Naiman, Dora Niesenholtz, Arthur Perlstein, Moshe Pfefferman, Bert Pinchas, Adele Plock and Leonard Polly, Helene Poracacini, Sandy Rhodes, Abe Rosenberg, Gladys Ross, Alan Rothstein, Marilyn Sachs, Parveen Shushane Sahimi, Esther Schiffman, David Schlesinger, Elsie Schwartz, Harry Schaefer, Benjamin Shapiro, Harvey Shore, Tilly Slackman, Hershey Solomon, Martin Sonny, Peter Van Doom, Ann Winkler, Benjamin Wolf, Michael Zaret, Bert Zeberman. Those in mourning and observing a yard site, rise at this time for Kadish Yatom, page 207. Yitkadal v'yitkadash merava, be'alma divrach v'yute v'yamlich ma'afute. וחייכון וביומכון ובחיי דחורבי ישראל, בעגלה ובזמן חריב אמרו אמן. יהי שמי רבה מבורך לעולם עומי עומיה. יתברך וישתבח ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנשא, ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דחודשה בריחו. לילה מנקו ברכתה ושירתה, תושבחתה ונחמתה, שמירן ביומה ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיא, וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן, עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. May the one who creates peace on high bring peace to each and to all of Israel and all who dwell on earth as we say אמן. Now, by the way, you know the reference. May the one who creates peace on high now you know what that means. Mm -hmm. But we've always said it, but we've never realized that it is Aish and Mayim that that prayer is talking about, the opposites that are necessary to bring together for peace in this world. Shabbat shalom, everybody. A couple of quick announcements before we conclude our service. Number one is um, if you have not signed up for June 27th yet, it's not too late. Do it now. Do it quickly. Join us for this remarkable day of return, renew, rejoice, re-entry, Sunday, June 27th. Yeah. Indeed. If you are um, free on Wednesdays during the uh, summer months, please join Cantor Rafi beginning on June 30th at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom for a series of classes exploring Five Known Women Prophets in the Tanakh, 7.30 p.m., June 30th. And on, um, yeah, starting in July, Friday nights, every other week, we're going to be in shul. And then the other weeks, we're going to be on Zoom. When we're in shul, each Shabbat is going to offer a different flavor, July, July 9th. July 9th, the first flavor is Shabbat under the stars. So come to our very first Shabbat under the stars on July 9th. Did I miss anything? That's it. Okay. With that, then, we're going to make Kiddush and conclude our service as we started our service with our Zamru melody and wish all of you a healthy, a wonderful, a relaxed, a meaningful Shabbat. A mazel tov to all our graduates. 
a mazel tov to our newlyweds and their families and to all of us Shabbat Shalom. I'm starting in July. No, actually starting in August. Um, Hopefully we will have Kiddush lunches again. So July we're getting our license back, then we need to do a little bit of prep and training and all that, and hopefully by August, Barbara has already offered to come and make tuna fish for each one of us every single Shabbat morning. Thank you, Barbara. That's the liquor license, right? Yes. Yes. And thanks to Danny and John, our musicians, yeah. making this service yeah. so yes, wonderful. Shabbat shalom, all. Shabbat shalom.